Um, welcome everyone to this seminar on 40 years of modeling, 40 years of, of uh, wheat data. The International Wheat Improvement Network has actually been going on for longer than that, but the systematic collection of data that we're considering in this is from the last 40 years. There's been a lot of effort has been put into uh, curating the data and, uh, and um, some recent analyses has, has been published by Wei. He will talk about that, looking at genotype by environment uh, interaction and how climate change has affected that. And as Zam, you will, you will start kick off now. Zam's a postdoctoral fellow. That's right, isn't it? At Henan. And you will start off by talking about um, temperature effects. Sorry, you were talking, sorry, that's not right, is it? We'll start off by talking about um, You see my screen? Yeah, it's, it's that's right, it's optimal, optimal temperature response function to simulate wheat yield. So please go ahead, Azam. Okay. Uh, Good you may need to share your, yes, that's good. Share yes, now screen. you see? Yeah. Okay. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for this opportunity. It's a great honor for me. And thank you, Matthew, for coordinating this uh, webinar. Uh, so I start my talk about the optimal temperature response function to simulate wheat yield across the globe. Uh, as you know, high temperatures, uh, affect the crop, per, crop performance and growth uh, and development of the crop, and it uh, reduces the uh, final yield. Previous studies have shown that the modeling crop responses to temperature is the greatest source of uncertainty. In addition to high temperatures, uh, currently the Earth is undergoing a global atmospheric drying as a result of uh, an increasing in uh, atmospheric water vapor pressure deficit. And recently many literature reported that uh, this high, high VPD will reduce cross primary production of the ecosystem or it uh, reduced, it has a negative impact on the crop yields. In fact, the debates about the uh, impact of the vapor pressure deficit uh, on radiation use efficiency and crop yield uh, has started since 1999 when uh, Sinclair wrote a comment on the Kinneri paper that uh, claimed that the high BPD uh, will uh, reduce the uh, crop yield. And uh, Sinclair uh, emphasized that to test such a hypothesis, we need a uh, high range of data with a more robust and accurate uh, method or technique. So to answer these questions, we collect the data from different locations around the globe. Uh, we collect the data from Australia, two sites in China, and some uh, and South Asia countries, including two sites in Nepal, one site in Faisalabad, and uh, two sites uh, in India, Lutiana and Pusa, and one site in uh, Bangladesh, Jamalpur, and one site in Karaj, Iran. Uh, two sites also in Colorado and uh, in United States, including Colorado and Arizona, and uh, one site in uh, Mexico, which is Obregon. Obregon experiment and uh, Indian site, uh, site experiment, they include two uh, type of experiment, high uh, yield potential experiment and high temperature experiments. Here I give you a brief uh, information about the uh, temperature variability of a different location. For example, we have covered a geograph wide geographical location. Uh, Arizona has a high, high daily temperature and daily maximum temperature. Uh, instead, uh, Kathmandu in Nepal has a, a very low temperature compared to other sites. And Karaj also uh, has high temperature. And for high temperature experiment, because the sowing date is later than uh, normal or yield potential experiment, these uh, experiments also uh, face with high temperature at, uh, by the end of March. 
And we, in our study, we focus on the period from heading to maturity. And another uh, temperature index we use in our study, it was, uh, uh, it was T-day, which calculate by uh, 25% 20 of daily minimum temperature plus 75% of daily maximum temperature. If we, for, if we use uh, uh, T-day, we see, because we focus on the period from uh, heading to maturity, therefore rarely we have the temperature below 10 degree or temperature above 36 degree. And uh, the primary analysis, simple analysis of the relationship between yield and uh, um, average of uh, daily maximum temperature and daily minimum temperature sh show just a, a light negative coloration between yield and temperature. Also for the number of the days from heading to maturity, uh, we just saw a, a weak uh, color negative coloration between the number of the days from heading to maturity and the average of daily maximum temperature. So to uh, uh, systematically dif uh, simulate the uh, grain yield, uh, we, we design an algorithm to simulate wheat yield for the period from heading to maturity based on the uh, gross primary production at the daily step. And uh, we calculate GPP based on the T-day, I-PAR, solar radiation, uh, radiation use efficiency and different temperature functions. Uh, and uh, in, in our study, we calculate IPAR by NDVI and we use the radiation use efficiency equal three. For weather data, we use the Ag era five weather data. And we assume that 20% of the GPP to be lost due to respiration and all the accumulated carbon from heading to maturity is go and converted to grain yield. Uh, actually, NDVI is the um, common phenotyping trait in semit experiment, and it usually measured from heading to maturity. And we uh, we use these NDVI values, and to create the daily NDVI, we use uh, uh, linear interpolation to uh, calculate the daily NDVI, and based on this uh, daily NDVI values, we calculate in the daily IPAR for our algorithm. So for the temperature function, which is the main part of this uh, uh, modeling exercise, we use the T-day as the input of the uh, three different temperature functions. And the first temperature function and the basic one we mm, test in our study, it was the photosynthesis reduction um, factor. We capture it from series with version two. This uh, temperature function has only one cardinal temperature, which is called T optimum. And uh, we created uh, uh, 11 uh, te optimum temperature from 15 to 25 degree. And we run our temperature function and uh, consequently our yield algorithm for 11 times for different optimum temperature to see which one is the best one for our data set. The second temperature function, it was Wang Engli temperature function. Uh, this uh, temperature function requires uh, three, optim three cardinal, cardinal temperature, which is a, a minimum temperature, optimal temp temperature, and maximum temperature. In, uh, we, in fact, we play around with different temperatures. For example, for T mean, we assume that it can be from zero to uh, 10 or for uh, maximum temperature, we assume that it can change between 25 to 36 or higher. And in total, we created uh, around 2,300 combination. It means that we run our yield algorithm with 2,300 uh, different combinations. It was a huge work actually. And uh, the last temperature function, it was the, um, uh, trapezoid temperature function. In trapezoid temperature function, we assume that the photosynthesis require a wide uh, range of uh, optimum temperature. Uh, point B and C in this uh, uh, 
figure show the T opt mean and T opt max and A means T mean and uh, T and D also means T maximum. Actually, with this temperature function, we try to cover a variety of temperature function in different crop models, as you see on the figure, this figure published in uh, Wang paper in Nature Plants. Uh, it means that we just try to consider all the potential uh, temperature in our uh, simulation exercise. For model evaluation, instead, of, uh, in addition to R square and the slope of the regression line, we use other mo model uh, um, evaluation indexes such as mean absolute error, MSE mean square error, uh, RMSE, and uh, RMSRE, model efficiency, model accuracy, and mean absolute percent percentage error. Due to the size of the calculation, because it was a huge uh, uh, calculation, we um, run all the simulation uh, on uh, SEMIT HPC and some of the simulation we ran it on uh, HAU HPC. And this is the primary result for photosynthesis reduction factor. And it, as I mentioned, we try to make a balance between all the um, model uh, evaluation indexes. For example, we try to find the highest uh, if model efficiency, the lowest uh, MAE or the highest R square and the lowest RMSE. And we found that uh, for photosynthesis reduction factor, the best temperature for our data set is the T day equal 18 degree. And you see that the model uh, performed well actually. And uh, for Wang and Engli equation and uh, trapezoid temperature function also we follow the same process uh, we, because we cannot uh, decide only based on the R square or the slope of the regression line. So we consider all the model indexes for temperature function also we uh, make a balance between all the in indexes and finally we uh, selected the right combination for each temperature function. As you see, figure A uh, show that the uh, photosynthesis reduction factor based on the optimum temperature equal 18 degree. And Wang equation, we found that the best temperature for this uh, equation for our data set, T mean equal 8 degree and T optimum equal 20 degree and T max equal 36 degree. And for the trapezoid temperature function also, uh, maximum temperature, we found that it could be around 42. And the minimum temperature, it could be between zero to one degree and the T opt mean and max also is around 20 and 21. You see that uh, uh, these three uh, temperature function, actually they are very close together. One reason for this result could be because uh, we use the T day as the input of the different temperature functions. And uh, when we calculate the T day, as I mentioned in the earlier slide, we don't have the very low temperature or very high temperatures. And uh, because we focus on the, and another reason is that because we focus on the period from heading to maturity. And uh, the second uh, question we wanted to answer by this modeling exercise, as uh, I mentioned, it was the impact of the uh, high BPD on uh, irrigated wheat yield. Uh, if you look at two different uh, location, we collected data. Uh, it showed that uh, again, Kathmandu in uh, Nepal, it has a high BPD. Instead, Arizona, we have a very high BPD. Sorry, Kathmandu has very low VPD and Arizona has very high VPD. Karaj also enjoy a high VPD and high temperature experiment. Also, uh, these three locations have very high VPD. And this uh, green color show that the uh, uh, optimum uh, VPD range based on the literature. And I would like to mention uh, two important uh, literature and that uh, recently published. 
One is the systematic effect of the rise, rising atmospheric vapor pressure deficit on plant physiology and productivity published in Global Change Biology. And the second one is the plant responses to rising vapor pressure deficit. Both uh, papers um, conclude that uh, with high VPD, global warming, high temperature, and high VPD, it reduces the global uh, gross primary production of the ecosystems, and it has a negative impact on yield. So to, to test this hypothesis, we capture figure A from uh, this literature. Figure A uh, actually calculated and made by different uh, uh, is made by is made by data collected from different ecosystems. It covers a wide variety of ecosystems. And if we see this figure, we can find such a ramp function in the figure. It means that the uh, VPD equal one is the optimum, and uh, we don't have any reduction for the uh, gross primary production for VPD equal one. And from one, it start uh, the photosynthesis or gross primary production, it uh, uh, will reduce until VPD equal four. And based on figure A, we created uh, or we design uh, a VPD stress factor. We call it VPD stress factor. We assume that based on this literature, we assume that the VPD stress factor equal one means no VPD stress factor. Actually, the result of our model also, we can assume that they are based on the uh, no VPD stress. And uh, uh, VPD from one, we have the photosynthesis reduction until VPD equal four. Two, and uh, the second step, we apply this uh, VPD stress function to our um, yield algorithm. And you see the uh, result of the simulation that it showed that the mo model doesn't perform well. For example, in locations such as Arizona, we have very high VPD as you saw in the previous figures, the observed uh, yield is equal uh, 7.5, but the simulated one is very low because we apply this VPD stress factor and which is not correct. And it means that based on, based on this um, uh, calculation, it means that the VPD uh, under well water conditions, VPD doesn't uh, limit, limit uh, wheat yield and to somehow Actually, we reply to Sinclair paper, but to be sure about the result of uh, this uh, uh, simulation, we try we try to play around with different uh, uh, threshold. We call it lower threshold and upper threshold, and we like uh, our temperature function. We create a wide variety of. Uh, uh, threshold for our VPD stress factor. And all the results show that the VPD doesn't have impact on irrigated uh, wheat yield. And another hypothesis, uh, some people claim that if we use canopy temperature and the VPD calculated by canopy temperature, maybe we see some result. We repeat all the simulation and we didn't see any impact uh, of the, any negative impact of the VPD on yeah. irrigated wheat yield. So in conclusion, in this study, temperature, in fact, temperature doesn't have significant effect on the duration of the heading to maturity. And the high temperature affects the rate of photosynthesis mainly. And three uh, temperature functions follow the same shape. And in environment where uh, T day, is greater than 20 degree during the grain filling period. Uh, grain yield is reduced by 5% for each uh, degree. This result actually is consistent with uh, previous literature. And VPD doesn't have, uh, a, in, doesn't uh, affect the irrigated wheat yield in our study. So at the end, I would like to say thanks, uh, thanks to all the people who help us and share 
the data with us first i would like to say thanks to my mentor in semi china with uh, and maze joint center uh, urs and uh, thank you to matthew reynolds and francisco to share the oregon data and a uh, uh, huge part of this data come from uh, jesse poland uh, uh, South Asia with uh, Genomic uh, Project and Jesse Poland and uh, Utom and Margaret, they share the, the data about the South Asia. And Kelly, uh, he uh, provided the data from Mar uh, Arizona and uh, Mariano uh, provided the data from Australia. Uh, Sarah from Karaj, she provided data for Karaj and uh, two other colleague uh, Adel and uh, Hayon also provide the uh, China data. And also Carlo, he processed the ag era 5 data and uh, many thanks to Ernesto Giron for uh, revising my script and uh, he did the automation process also. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Asam. <clears throat> that was great. Now let's hold the questions to the end. And we'll move on to uh, Carlo's presentation. And uh, Carlo's working in uh, CIMID in the, in the uh, sustainable intensification program. And he's gonna talk about um, estimating wheat canopy temperature uh, uh, as, a, as a substitute for just using MET data when estimating, when simulating uh, Growth. Carlo, over to you. Are you able to share your screen? Carlo is, is participating. He told me some reason he's not in the pan with the panelists. Okay, I think then to, we seem to have a technical difficulty. So I'm going to ask Wei if would you mind going next? Wei yeah. Wei's talk is he's at at uh, Henan University with the Simit Henan program, and and um, he's going to be talking about his recent paper in Nature Plants, where um, looking at the effect of climate change on rank changes, very key issue for. For, for planning breeding in the future. Way over to you. <clears throat> okay, let me share my screen. Uh, good morning, good evening, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm glad to introduce my uh, all recent uh, publication uh, in Nature Plants. Yeah, so we are uh, conducting some uh, initial analysis of the Ivan data and try to understand what's the uh, story behind it. So the title of the presentation is Increased Ranking Change of Weight Grading on Climate Change. This, this is a, a teamwork uh, which, uh, which was conducted by, uh, contributed by, by CMIT and also HAU and some other institute. Uh, it will include, uh, let me, yeah, uh, several part. Yeah, so the first one is the research background. Uh, background. So uh, why we do such research? Because uh, CIMIT has different uh, breeding goals uh, comparing to other breeders. And the CIMIT's breeding methodology is tailored to develop widely adapted uh, disease resistant geplasm with higher and uh, sleep across a wide range, uh, wide range of environments. So. This methodology has permitted uh, the uh, uh, parameting of a large number of multiple resistance uh, genes for use against uh, by its, uh, a wide uh, spectrum of diseases and the tolerance to uh, abort, uh, abortic uh, stresses. Um, one indication uh, for the success of this uh, approach is that uh, over 80% of released wheat cultivars in the developing world have been uh, had uh, symmetric plasm uh, in the uh, paddy green. So we hope this uh, we we hope this um, methodology can be successful in the future. 
Uh, the, there are two main component of this methodology. Uh, the, the first one is to uh, test uh, to test all the plasmas uh, on optimum conditions, which was conducted in Mexico, and uh, and and another key component is to test advanced selected advanced lights in multiple locations that represent diversified uh, diversified environments, which uh, which was uh, the objective of Iowan uh, Iowan nursery uh, date. Uh, although uh, this method, uh, this approach exists, uh, it uh, it affected by some emerging yeah uh, uh, emerging uh, risks. Uh, one component very interesting uh, interesting uh, concern for breeders is the G by D. Uh, so the genotype environment interaction, so the GI, so that that, that was that that are the uh, differential responses of the genotype to environments. So GEI that affect every aspect of decision making, uh, incorporating especially uh, the semit breeding, this pre uh, pre breeding that target for wide adaptations because it affect um, it may affect the selection efficiency, life cycle, environment clustering, and also uh, breeding goals. There was a long history of studying GEI in breeding community, so more than over. Uh, half centuries to map, uh, to measure, to map, and uh, to utilize the GI. Uh, for example, uh, SEMIT also has its tools, uh, has many tool models um, to, to, to investigate the GI, and also SEMIT used the mechanical environment concept to handle the GIs as well. Um, there are two types of uh, GI, so that can be uh, grouped into two categories. So every, mm, that's um, all the breeders know it. Uh, so they, uh, they they can classify into crossover and no crossover interactions. So the first uh, column that uh, uh, crossover interaction and uh, and, the, and the right one is a low crossover interaction. So uh, crossover interaction are associated with a significant rank change in uh, uh, phenotypic tree such as year and uh, so you, uh, crossover interaction are or are what concern breeder most because it can potentially uh, jeopardize the selection of better genotypes you know, with a higher likelihood of smaller you know, genetic, uh, genetic gains yeah, as more crossover occurs. Yeah, because of uh, these goals, we face some uh, challenges of climate change because in all sides, the climate change is significant. Uh, and we also observe, find observed and the predict impacts of, uh, of climate change on weighted year and cognitives and stabilities and the, the first uh, the, the the first plots show uh, show the economic results yeah for some nursery trials we found that there are significant changes of uh, climate change on year and uh, and the second plot shows that the, the predicted the change of uh, year on the climate change for all the weight areas we can see that uh, there's a uh, substantial decrease of yield in, in, in most of the weight areas. So uh, we already know some impacts on yield quality and stability, but we don't know these effects on breeding approaches. Yeah, so we want to know what's the what's the impact on the approaches. But there there are lots of the challenges, lots of the bottlenecks uh, to investigate this uh, this 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 aspects. Yeah, because there we have limitation on method, we have limitation on on data as well. So. Uh, in this study, so we use Ivan Date. Uh, Ivan Date, uh, that's International Weight Improvement Network uh, nursery date. Uh, so in this date, we have connected, uh, uh, Ivan have, uh, has connected over uh, 10 million raw uh, phenotypic data points. Uh, this data uh, spans from 1979 to, pre to the present over, over more than 90 countries. Uh, for this study, so we link the nursery sign, nursery date to uh, link the nursery date to, to the weather data. So we use the ERA5 weather data and to link this data to the set together and try to understand what's the impact on, yeah, on, on, on GYE. So in this study, we only use four nursery data sets. Uh, the first one is the uh, SV. SV uh, that's test uh, high yielding spring bread wheat. Uh, 
uh, during uh, under large optimum environment and the management conditions, we use uh, international dual uh, uh, dual nursery. Yeah, so it has the same nursery as the uh, same goal as the SV, but uh, focuses on uh, dual weight, and we also have high temperature weight yield uh, trial, which we call uh, high weight. Uh, it evaluates supreme bread weight on hot irrigating environments. And the last one is the semi uh, arid weight uh, year trial. It uh, evaluates supreme weight, you know, supreme bread weight uh, that, uh, that is special, uh, specially bred to maintain year on the dry and drought prone conditions. And we also have this ME system that uh, uh, indicated by different colors. So uh, in terms of the method, we hope that we can use very simple method, very straightforward method to investigate the impacts. So we follow our, uh, we, we follow where traditional breeding use the method, breeders use the method. So using uh, standard quantitative genetic models to investigate the GEI. So uh, we have uh, we have addictive effects with uh, gelatine, which has uh, 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 environment. Uh, we also have the multi uh, multi uh, multi uh, in the uh, roles that the GEI, and we use uh, phenol weeks and uh, method uh, models to identify crossover G by uh, G by E. So uh, so that's where traditional and uh, uh, and widely used the method to 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 identify the uh, crossover. And uh, for this uh, for these two models, we modify the up models by bringing in climate variables. Yeah, so we including uh, six climate variables. We split the, uh, uh, the growing season to three important stages, and bring all these climate variables into the up mentioned models. And finally, we estimate the occurrence of ranking change by counting the number. Uh, of the crossing over for all testing lines or crossing all testing sites. And, the, and in terms of the performance of the models, we evaluated, uh, evaluated these final results. We found that the model reasonable, uh, reasonably uh, predicted the temporary variability in crossover accuracy, that's, 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 which was good. And the, way, uh, the, the, mod, uh, the model the yield vari uh, variation correctly predicted the accuracy of ranking change for over 75% of light tiles, which uh, ranged from 75% uh, from ice wind to 82% from hydro wind. And furthermore, uh, the prediction accuracy can be further in, improved if we if we we we, we use more climate uh, variables we use more uh, other environment variables into the model so that's that that was very good so we still can have a space to improve the model to make more uh, accurate prediction on crossover impact uh, uh, accuracy uh, regarding the results, we have four results. The result one is uh, we uh, observed the temporary trend of ranking change occurrence, which was totally based on the observed year. We found that on average, um, uh, there, there was 16% uh, of live pals that experienced the crossover infection across the four nurseries. Um, we, we found that all nurseries experienced suddenly um, and fast increases in crossover accuracy except the high wind. This suggests that ranking change has become more frequent since the trial began. So the increase was markedly high in two allied trials, which was SV and idle wind. Yeah, so the the, the, the increase of crossover is, is quite high increase. Yeah, which uh, they because they um, and in in high wind, yeah, in high wind, and uh, so the crossover occurrence decreased slightly uh, from 1992 to 2019. Yeah, because the high wind only uh, it starts uh, from 1992, it is short. So this trend is more significant. Yeah, but there's a there was a decrease in trend. Uh, result two, that's uh, the climate explanation power. We we uh, we first uh, investigate uh, the climate change trend, we found that temperature in, uh, in the three stages of the wheat growing season uh, from uh, in, in most sites increased significantly over the years, uh, accompanied by erratic precipitation patterns and the changes in other climatic uh, variables such as the VPD. 
uh, and there, uh, there were also changes in spatial variations of some climate variables, such as minimum temperature, humidity, and reflection the enhanced spatial uh, heterogeneity of growing season uh, environment. That uh, that means there have some uh, potential risks on, on, on breeding on, on our trials. And uh, and all simulated, year, uh, all simulated year variations uh, with climate vectors uh, can explain um, nearly 80% of the yearly variability in crossover currency. So we, that means we can use this model to predict, um, yeah, predict the crossover currency in, in the other environments. And uh, in terms of the result three, climate change contribution, we found that uh, the simulation for all trials side confirmed the effects of climate change on crossover currency, yeah, with different uh, differences apparent among trials. This this result is totally based on the simulation uh, simulated year. And we found that the climate change generally uh, reduced the performance uh, stability of yellow types of cross environment in high yielding breeding programs. And the crossover is happy to a small increase in headwind and likely because of the consistent hard environment uh, depressed the yield overall. And we also uh, identified that the so, uh, SW, SAWYT is the only nursery yeah, that experienced the decreasing uh, trend for crossover. Uh, so this plot should estimate the changes in crossover that caused by climate change for the four, trial, uh, for the four trials. Uh, the thin line shows the uh, medium trend and the, and the, and the, and the, and the thin, and, and the thin line shows the uh, shows the trend for different uh, cultivar group. Uh, result four, that's breeding rule. We, we're comparing to the impacts caused by climate change. Uh, the genetic improvement uh, since the 1980s has larger uh, effects on crossover infection. That, uh, that, mm, that's reasonable, right? Uh, and also uh, the three uh, trials, S weight, anti weight, and the uh, SW. YT is happy the substantial increase in crossover in, uh, occurrences. So this three, uh, this three, yeah, the first three, yeah, that uh, that indicated a tendency in weight breeding to target more specific environments. Um, the how uh, the head weight, uh, the head weight is one uh, gives an onion trial showing decreasing crossover occurrence. Uh, this suggests the global development of uh, of uh, heat tolerant genotypes has uh, increased the weight adaptation adaptation for warmer climate. Uh, so uh, this is the uh, result for uh, for the conclusion and the implications. Uh, so. The first conclusion uh, that we, 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 we draw is that uh, this study is provide yeah, concrete evidence that climate change has affected with breeding. Yeah, so this is the first, uh, this is the first new result. And the because yeah, breeding uh, of annual crops is uh, quite a fast track for more evaluation. Yeah, uh, breeders are usually uh, optimism about uh, ignoring climate change. Yeah, because they, they think that trials are normally uh, conducted different environments, so don't, they don't care about uh, long-term uh, changes. But our fighting on the mind is optimism. Yeah, we, 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 we found that climate change may increase the GI, you know, which will impact uh, in, 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 in genetic gains. And the conclusion too is that climate change since the late 80s has increased the ranking change in global wheat breedings. Uh, this uh, all 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 result um, they support the widely uh, widely held belief that higher GI higher G by E uh, will be expected yeah, due to the warm, uh, warmer climate. Uh, so this this auto genotype ranking change has a, a number of implications for breedings. Yeah, suggesting uh, including less efficiency in genotype selection and uh, uh, discarding of some uh, potential useful lines and also increasing environment. Uh, uh, heterogeneity, modification of macro environment, classification, and even uh, reduce the genetic gains. And, and the last uh, conclusion is that in spite of climate warming, there, there, there have been increasing gradient due to improved its pattern. Yeah, but with, yeah, but with totally different performance before, between high yielding and stress 
breeding programs. So that means this, uh, this, this, this always are pro, uh, highlights there are some potential highlight uh, of, of, of uh, stress breeding program to uh, increase yield uh, and also increase the adaptation uh, capacity of weight. So, so that's the, that's the result. Uh, and uh, we, we, we still have next steps. Uh, so uh, we, we still want to understand what's the, um, what's the effective mechanism behind. Uh, so how this uh, climate change, how climate change and how the GBI change will affect in the breeding goal. And uh, so what's the selection efficiency will be affected. So yeah, we, 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 we are working on uh, to develop method to, uh, to, invest, uh, to investigate yeah, how these uh, factors can affect. We also want to know uh, will the climate change will uh, def uh, redefine the macro environment. So, so that's that's the next step. Uh, uh, and also, we hope that we can develop robust agile tools to facilitate the life selection and reduce experimental costs. So that's quite uh, reasonable and uh, usable tools that can uh, can be used by breeder and to to to. Uh, to faster to increase the uh, to increase the um, experiment uh, efficiency, uh, so we can use the tool, we can use these tools to fill data gap. Yeah, because uh, in trials we have many data gaps uh, in terms of the uh, philology and also some other uh, yield uh, component. And we also can use the tools to uh, to make some uh, phenotypic prediction uh, beyond our trail environments. So that's uh, that can ex extend our, uh, our our environment. So we also hope to utilize other tools such as machine learning methodology and also pro, uh, process-based models uh, in our, uh, in our uh, analysis. Uh, that's it. Yeah, so this is quite a brief introduction. Uh, if you want to know more about the uh, research, you can go deeply into the paper and contact us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wei. That <clears throat> very important results there for breeders. Next talk, <clears throat> Carlos Montes, he's an agricultural climatologist at CIMIT, and he's going to be talking about estimating wheat canopy temperature for meteorological data. Over to you, Carlos. Just unmute. Let me share my screen. Um. Way you have to stop sharing your screen first, then the system will allow me share mine. Yeah, that's Please. right. Okay. The same. Okay, now. Good. Can you see my screen? Great. Yeah. Okay. Good morning uh, to everyone. Good morning in Mexico, at least. Um, thank you for the invitation uh, to present my work. This is an ongoing work that we've been performing during the last this year, and uh, with uh, Asam, who presented already some some very relevant results to under understand my this work actually. With Urs also from Simit. Um, okay, this is this the title of this presentation is just estimating with canopy temperature from meteorological data uh, using a multi location approach. I will talk a little bit about the motivation, objectives, the data we used, some global results, and some conclusions. Just to start, um, the land surface temperature in general it's uh, very relevant for multiple processes in. in, in and crop modeling and water and evapotranspiration, etc. That land surface temperature is an equilibrium variable in the land surface energy balance process. We have from one side that the surface temperature control controls the emanated um, thermal radiation from a surface, but also the the turbulent fluxes, sensible heat, heat and latent heat that is evapotranspiration, and the soil heat fluxes. Um, canopy temp uh, temperature and land surface temperature has been for a long time associated with studied as a process associated with uh, with water status of a vegetated surface is a main input variable 
of um, many evapotranspiration, evapotranspiration models of um, one, other, one dimensional models and remote sensing models based on, on, on the thermal infrared um, radiation. It has been used also for crop water status monitoring and uh, irrigation scheduling, for example. And it's an indicator of the stress conditions since the transpiration and the evaporation process dissipates the energy. So the, the, the higher the, 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 the difference between air temperature, for example, and the canopy temperature, it's, a, it's an indicator of how plants are trans, transpirating water. And canopy temperature has, has been also used for in breathing programs um, for, for stress, for example. And it's, it's, uh, since it's a low cost method when, when, when infrared thermometers are used, and non-destructive, rapid, accurate, and with, um, a large number of samples, it's uh, possible to be taken. Um, and not many words have has been uh, um, used canopy temperature in crop modeling, but uh, the literature is increasing and in, uh, the, saying the importance of canopy temperature as a process, and that should be incorporated into crop models. Since, uh, for example, the effect of high temperatures um, uh, yeah, extreme temperature events uh, can affect the water status and the generating heat stress on on crops and, and on yields, now affecting yields and also the plant physiological response to heat stress. Some authors say that uh, air temperatures is better related with uh, the, the response to stress than air temperature. That is a kind of proxy of uh, of plant temperature. So. We can find literature saying that the canopy temperatures can be a better predictor than air temperature of the impact of high temperature events on crop yields, for example. But unfortunately, canopy temperature and land surface temperature, and it's not routinely measured because there are no stations, for example, systematically or sensor sensors systematically measuring temperature. So it's very difficult to obtain long-term time series for climate change impacts studies. For example. So the objective of this work is just to estimate with canopy temperature from meteorological data in order to generate long-term time series for or from diverse with growing areas in the world and, and, and also to generate data, data sets to be used in long-term assessments of relevant processes and in crop modeling. So um, the, the approach, well, this is, we use a set uh, of observations of infrared, uh, of canopy temperature obtained with infrared thermometers from multiple locations and experiments in Bangladesh, India, the US, and South Asia, China. We see the map here, or the, the, the red dots are the locations of the canopy temperature measurement locations. They come from multiple institutions, from universities uh, and research centers in different countries. The, these data are very variable. And for example, we have a long time series for France, but very uh, also for, for India, some for taking different full seasonal cycles. But for other locations like or other countries, like in Mexico or in Bangladesh, we have just measurements in one single um, season. So that's a kind of the um, difficulties that, as I mentioned, that um, there are no long-term time series. So that's why also we, we used a multi-location approach instead of a full seasonal cycle simulation. Um, the meteorological data we use is the Agira 5, which is a statistically, especially statistically downscale version of the Agira 5 reanalysis. As a, it's a gridded product of about 10 kilometers spatial resolution. Uh, it's available from 1979 to the present on, in almost real time today. And it was designed for agricultural applications. We use daily maximum temperature, relative humidity at 15 hours, which is um, assuming that it's the, the, it's the minimum relative humidity, daily accumulated solar radiation, and daily maximum vapor pressure deficit. Uh, for the model, we took only the closest closer point to every canopy temperature measurement site. 
Uh, we use, for, for the modeling, we use, as I said, a multi-location approach linear model because we don't have time series, continuous time series. Um, the main assumptions are that wheat is grown under non-limiting water conditions. So soil water content will not be a, a factor, I could say. And the meteorology would be the main driver of the variation of canopy temperature. And just, we, just, we, we just took the period from heading to maturity, where heading and maturity dates were taken from observations and crop simulations. This is the model approach. Uh, we took three variables, maximum temperature, solar radiation, and maximum vapor pressure deficit and an interaction term, uh, which would uh, capture the, the processes during the, the daytime. And this is the main equations where we have the variable, variables and the B, B are, of course, fitting parameters. Uh, there are many uncertainties in the, in the approach followed. Um, we, I can mention the, the as, as uncertainties associated with observations. For example, the canopy temperatures, canopy temperature data were taken from multiple um, plots and averaged for multi, from multiple plots. So that, uh, that's a source of uncertainty based on for, with, associated with the observations, but also with the forcing because we use uh, the meteorological data from a graded product instead of local observations. So there is a spatial aggregation process that, that it's also correspond to, a, to an uncertainty associated with the forcing. So we, uh, before, before fitting the model, we, we, we constrain the model to these conditions the, that canopy temperature can never be higher than maximum than air temperature, maximum temperature, and canopy temperature never can be never lower than the wet bulb temperature. That is a kind of lower limit. And wet bulb temperature is, a, is the temperature of a wet surface. Um, and canopy temperature depression, we remove um, outliers taking just the percentile of 10%. So that was some uh, were some assumptions. Some results, the summary, this is a summary of the observations for this filtering process. Uh, for this box plots are just ranked for different, for the different locations. So we have, for example, for canopy temperatures from around, I don't know, 14, 15 degrees in average for to more than 30 degrees. So it's a wide range of canopy temperature values in observations. Um, well, we have, as I mentioned, the, the available observations are very variable for different locations. We have longer time series for countries like France, but shorter av available data, data for other countries. Uh, this is the main results in terms of model output. On the left, we see the, the scatter plot between observed, observed um, canopy temperature and simulated. This is a very good results in terms of linear fit. Um, the final number of observation was 400. Uh, and we see that the, the, the color shows the average value in, in a ranking color. So they, they, they vary from around 10 or lower than 10 to more than 30 degrees. So it's a wide range of um, variability captured by the observations. Uh, you, I, I perform a bleep one out cross validation where the one out is a location here. And the model performs well, very similar results than the final model when we do for in, in a validation exercise. And this, this is scatter plots show the relationship between canopy temperature observed and simulated and meteorological variables. We see on the left that the vapor pressure deficit and canopy temperature is very similar for observations and simulations. Also for solar radiation in the middle, but for, for maximum temperature and canopy temperature, we see that observations has shows a wider range for the same maximum temperature, which is some, this, this is a kind of uh, something that we need to improve in terms of model performance, because this will, for example, impact other uh, variables, uh, such as the canopy temperature depression, where we show that there's a wider range of observations than for the model that 
result that come from from this results of the relationship between canopy temperature and air temperature. And this is just to show how the canopy temperature simulated is it depends, of course, of the environment and the, but also of the available data set. Um, for some countries like France, we have very good fit because we have also we have also higher number of observations for the countries who have lower observations and the performance is poorer than for, for other countries. Um, this is the, the error, the, uh, the error metric RMNC for, for, for different countries. In average, we have 1.6 degrees. Um, but on the, on the right panel, we see that there is not, there's not a clear association between the, between the error and the number of observations, which is, uh, I don't know. I was, I was expecting something more, more something clearer, but um, well, there are many limitations on the approach. Um, for example, it's some factors, things that we we need to include in, in in future future works to 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 try to improve results. And for example, the, to to assume optimal water conditions for the full seasonal cycle, it's something that. Is very complex uh, in terms of uh, in the field. For we know that um, water conditions are very variable from one day to another, up transpiration, etc. And uh, we use gridded input meteorological data. And also, one of the uncertainties and limitations come from the, the use of instantaneous canopy temperature observations or during a um, uh, one moment in the day versus the time integrated meteorological data, for example, the, the solar radiation. So it's, we're not comparing exactly the same, the same things, um, but also maybe we should include, include other variables that are relevant, just stomatal conductance or some aerodynamic processes, in terms of resistances and there are processes that are related with heat transfer in the land surface uh, or the leaf area index, also very relevant. In any case, uh, we will continue working on this for one of the, one of the what, something that I would like to have, for example, is more data from Southern Hemisphere. We don't have um, yet data for relevant countries in terms of wheat uh, growing, such as Australia or Argentina, I don't know. Um, and also we will, we will calculate with the model later canopy temperature for more locations. Like this is a map of the IWIN, the IWIN network where the idea is to, to obtain data for all these locations and maybe a gridded product for the using, using the globe, the, the width areas. And of course, using this long-term time series, this is a canopy temperature for Mexico obtained with the model from 1979 to the present. So the idea is to use this time series in experiments of climate change and, and crop modeling. Um, some concluding remark. Um, so we can say that canopy temperature can be well estimated using meteorological data and the modeling approach, statistical modeling approach. And the results are very variable from different locations with an error of one degree to 2.5, which is quite uh, wide. Um, and we need to explore a little bit more how the model performs for contrasting areas, such as dry versus, versus wet areas that we have in the observations and measurements from from North Africa, for example, and South Asia. Um, well, and one of one of the things that we need to improve it is that the, the system biases, such as in, in the relationship between canopy temperature and air temperature, can be transferred to other very relevant variables, such as uh, the canopy temperature depression. So, one of the questions is: uh, Should we include more variables uh, and processes, of course, into the model? So, those are the, the questions that we have today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlo. <clears throat> a very, very um, valuable exercise. 
Many people don't realize how different canopy and air temperature can be at high vapor pressure deficit. We've seen differences eight degrees sometimes, so it definitely has an effect at certain, certain times of day and environments. Anyway, we're on time. I do want to make some acknowledgements. And then for those who are able to stay, there's a few questions in the chat. First of all, all of the research conducted in and um, presented in this in this webinar were conducted by the CIMIT China Weed and Maize Joint Research Center. Uh, Zam was supported by Henan Agricultural University. Carla also receives funding from the CRP Wheat, and there was funding from CCAFs and Hedwig. Um, and the CIMIT. China Wheat and Maize Joint Research Project is funded by Henan Provincial Government and Henan Agricultural University. So those, uh, those are the sources of support for this work, which is ongoing. Uh, much of the work is part of the project we're calling Heat and, Heat and Drought Wheat Improvement Consortium. Now, let's see. Uh, we still have over 100 participants. That's great. So let's take a look at some of the questions. Um, first one I see from Masawa Abbas, who's, and I think this was for Azam, who says, how can we fix the base temperature for different areas? Do you have an answer for that, Azam? You're muted. You have to unmute. Can you unmute? Yes. Mm -hmm. Actually, for this modeling exercise, uh, we assume that we don't know any uh, minimum, optimum, and maximum temperature for our temperature function. And we, try, we play around with uh, many combination and based on, we run our model based on the many temperature uh, combination from zero to 45 for, uh, from zero to 45 for each uh, uh, T mean, T optimum, T max, and T, and uh, those two uh, optimum temperatures, T opt mean and T opt max. And by the model evaluation indexes, we found the right uh, temperature for each uh, uh, temperature combination. Is it clear? Yeah. So um, there's also from Abbas also the question of. Um, does low temperature increase the wheat yield or decrease it? And so I gave him a quick answer. In fact, <clears throat> it depends upon the optimal minimum temperature, which is something we don't know. And that's one of the exercises that we're trying to establish is, uh, is there an optimal, presumably there is an optimal minimum temperature because we know that high night temperature can decrease yield. That's been shown in several crops already. So there should be an optimum, but it may depend on the number of factors. So, so you guys are looking at that or also. Um, somebody asked if the presentation is available for the recording and they put an answer in the chat where you can find a link. Question for Carlo. Fluctuations in canopy temperature affect the lower leaves or not? What do you say about that, Carlo? Unmute. Fluctuations in canopy temperature affect lower leaves. Mm -hmm. Of course, okay. but all, well, every every leaf leaf will have a temperature. The point is, uh, we can't measure all the leaves, so it depends on the approach. I think uh, the the uh, an average of different leaves can be used for monitoring temperature, canopy temperature. That's what, uh, and the angle, they play with different, different um, measurement strategies. Uh, in modeling, modeling can be a bit different because it depends on the approach. There are some, some models that can, can can capture variability within the canopy, but most of models assume that it's a roughness, roughness length for momentum absorption. So you calculate that level in the canopy that you assume that is the main level where the exchange, exchanges of energy are happening. 
So in that case, you're simulating the temperature or the energy balance from a, for a level, for a, for a single level in the, in, within the canopy. So, you know, it depends on the approach, but biophysically or physiologically, of course, every, the, the, every leaf will be involved in the exchange of energy within a canopy. Yeah, and we, I guess we can assume that inside the canopy, boundary layer effects are much less than at the surface. Well, yes, actually, within the canopy, we have this logarithmic, you know, yeah. profile, and we and the absorption and the exchanges. There's a maximum. We, the, the, the curve is typically like this, so we, there's a maximum, a level of maximum exchanges of of energy and mass between the, the atmosphere and the canopy. So, the most of models are based on the difference of potentials of, for example, water vapor. So you take, you take one level of the canopy and one level in the atmosphere, the boundary layer. So, but again, physiologically, everything will be involved. That's the, the <laughs> we have to play with the different, what, what, we, what is happening, what we can measure, what we can simulate, et cetera. The equations available. Yep. Yeah. Um, so I have posted the link to to the uh, this webinar, somebody asked for it again. I posted it again. Um, not sure why I didn't get through. A question from Vinay uh, Kellen, Jerry. Not quite sure. How will you how will you consider meteorological data in case of none um, non stationarity? Well, I'm not sure. Do you do you get that one, Carlo? See the last question here and questions and answers. Oh no, the second to last. Maybe, maybe Vinay, you can send that question again. Um, mm, so yeah, I wouldn't know. there's a question here, another one for you, Asam. Um, apart from temperature, what are the factors constrain the model? How do we separate soil moisture induced stress from these temperature induced stresses? Last question from Samuel Kouamwa. How we separate soil moisture? Induced stresses from, from other factors that will affect uh, temperature. It's a good question because uh, irrigation data and water availability data in the soil is, is among the hardest to collect of any meteorological data. I expect you would agree with that, Carlo. Although we're looking into ways to use remote sensing to estimate, to calibrate that. Where well, you have less questions, I think, because you published your, your work recently. So I think most people can refer to that and, and, and uh, get their questions answered. Any, uh, any suggested answer, Assam? For so I think it's. I think it's, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. The question is apart from soil moisture, what are the factors? And I think Carlo alluded to some of those in the last question, like leaf angle, no. position in the canopy. Um, and of course in breeding trials, unfortunately we often confounded by height. So even neighboring effects can, neighbors and borders can also have effects on temperature. But in general, the main important factor is uh, moist soil moisture, you know, and because of the irrigation, we remove this uh, factor actually. But uh, ad, among other factors, nothing come to my mind. Yeah, well, the funny thing is, you say that with irrigation, we remove the factor, but there's also the, the, the frequency of irrigation. One, we, we, we see can canopy temperature changes during the, uh, interval between when you first irrigate and when you're about to irrigate. Typically, that's when we come in and irrigate when the canopy temperature is starting to warm up. And then many, many regions of the world are not irrigated or have limited water, so you have reduced irrigation. So uh, irrigation, in theory, can overcome those effects but uh, of, of, of water deficit or water limitation. But in reality, even with irrigation, and especially in rain-fed environments, as a, those effects are pretty huge. 
I, I would also cite the, the soil water balance calculations as, as, a, as an important component of it. Not only the soil, soil water content, but the whole uh, soil water balance. Yeah. So here's a question from Samuel again. Can the immediate temperature at some boundary layer above the surface be very different from air temperature? Now, I'm not sure of the last part. I'm not, I'm not sure about the question, but immediate at some boundary layer from air temperature. Well, air temperature is measured within the boundary layer. So maybe you mean a different height of the boundary layer. Yeah, but I, I'm not sure about the question. You got, I'm sure you can send that, set, retype it or send it to Carl. No. Okay, we have a, one more question here. Um, daily mean temperature is often calculated as a simple average of daily maximum min temperature. What's the rationale for using higher weight for maximum temperature as in Azama's presentation? You weighted oh. at 0.75. Uh, because we wanted to emphasize on the daily photosynthesis. And uh, in fact, uh, because uh, if we calculate the average temperature is not, a, although it's very common approach, but it's not accurate because it removes yeah. many extreme values. And recently we see that, for example, uh, Wang Engli equation, that one designed even for hourly temperature, not uh, mm. even average temperature. Uh, and we just uh, follow the basic and uh, even the oldest approach. And I can say that one is the most accurate one to allocate 70% of the maximum temperature to daily temperature and just 25% uh, of the uh, daily minimum temperature included in uh, daily photosynthesis. Yeah. No, I think that's a, it's, it's an important point because most Many MET stations record max and min. They don't get, say, hourly temperature. And you, you're saying when you when you actually calculate the real mean, it is weighted towards the, 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 the higher end, right? Yeah. Just to, the, the mean taking ma maximum and minimum is very good for statistical pro, um, purposes. But when you want to apply that for physiological, you know, in modeling, et cetera, it's uh, at least for plants, um, it's, it, it, it's good to have a kind of weight for the daytime processes because minimum temperature reflects what happens during the nighttime, you know, the nocturnal cooling before sunrise. So that's, that's the reason why it's very often these factors, like in this case, 75% weighted for daytime processes. Probably varies with the environment too, I would guess. Sorry, I imagine it would vary with the environment. The, that weighting must have no. must vary sure. with the environment. Here's mm -hmm. a question in in the chat: the effect of precipitations like vape, uh, fog, mist could have a great impact on canopy temperature due to evapotration, evapotration, or evapotranspiration effects. Um, that's a question, and I think the the answer is yes, absolutely. If you have a high High humidity, the air temperature and the leaf temperature is always going to be much closer. So, yes, because actually, the high uh, humidity makes the gradient of water vapor between leaves and the air to be lo much lower. So, the demand of water from the atmosphere decreases with high humidity. That's the physical process. And then we have a question from Victor Comrell, who says, what might be a good reason to model nighttime temperature? I can answer that in there. Somebody else would like to. I think, I think Victor, you, sorry, go ahead. may I add one thing? I think night, the importance of the night temperature is for respiration. And uh, right now, actually, there is a gap in crop uh, models that they, uh, doesn't uh, the crop model uh, don't calculate the um, respiration accurately? And uh, recently, there are some literature that uh, discuss about the hidden role of the nighttime, nighttime, nighttime temperature and respiration and so on. 
That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Vic, there's a big gap in in our understanding of the effect of nighttime temperature, um, and uh, it's it's like uh, Sam says, respiration is very likely because that's carrying on twenty four hours a day, unlike photosynthesis, which is only half the day. And then also nighttime temperature can have an effect on development rate. And again, that is uh, something that needs to be to be better understood. So this is a real frontier for research in crops, the effect of nighttime temperature. And again, the IWIN data set is an excellent body of data to be looking at some of these uh, effects. And uh, this, this work is ongoing. Carlo, you wanted to say something? I oh, know about you said the, the what the importance of night time temperature for crops and development. There are actually there are some recent research in terms of correlation between nighttime temperatures and yields, etc., like physiological processes. Um, I, I can say there are more interest in in terms of ecosystem processes instead of plant physiology. Uh, it's what I know from modeling, for example. Uh, for, for carbon balances because soil processes and grasses and other plants you know in the ecosystem can play a role in terms of carbon balances and respiration and photosynthesis but for in for, for crop modeling and yields and things like that I think it's the daytime processes when photosynthesis happens so so it's uh, we'll be more focused on, on those processes instead of nighttime that's that's what I've seen I think uh, in the mm -hmm. current research. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, here's an interesting question. We still have 85 attendees, so plus the panelists, so we'll keep going until, until the panelists get tired. Um, any role of canopy temperature uh, on wheat aphids? I, that, that's an interesting question to me because uh, i never seen it before. Um, I would imagine that um, the, 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 the warmer the leaf, the more active the aphids are, up to a certain point anyway. But does anyone have any insights on the interaction of wheat aphids and temperatures of leaves? A wheat, I, I think aphids generally more problem are the warmer, yes, the warmer yes. conditions. So yes. I guess uh, when we have drought and the leaf temperatures a warmer are unable to cool themselves, it's quite likely that aphids become more of a problem. I don't didn't see Leo in Leo um, Crespo in the attendees, but if he's here, Leo, maybe you can give us an answer. Um, and here's a question. Oh no, that's an answer. Okay, I think we are out of questions. So thank you very much again to the panelists and the speakers. That was a, 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 a very useful um, overview of some of the outputs that's coming up from this analysis of this big data set, 40 years of wheat inter, International Wheat Improvement Network. Thank you to all the IWIN participants who are here. And uh, Kai, if you're here, you want to announce the next seminar or are you too wrapped up in your other meeting? Well, looks like Kai's um, probably tied up in another meeting, but Kai will be uh, announcing another, the last big data modeling community of practice seminar of the year presently. So thanks, thanks again, uh, Asam, Carlos, Way. great talks. Thank you to the audience and uh, Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.